Good to see you all bright-eyed and bushy-tailed this morning. We're in for a good Sunday today, and I want to put it on your radar. We are two weeks away from our launch of Alpha. And if you're new to the church, you may be wondering, what is this Alpha and who is Alpha for? It's really simple. Alpha is a series of talks, dinner, drinks, and discussion over an eight-week period. And Alpha is for people that don't know Jesus yet. Maybe your friends, your family, your coworkers, maybe people that you've been inviting to church, but they're not interested in church on a Sunday yet. They're just not there, but they are willing to have a meal and they are willing to explore life's big questions. Alpha is also for people that are new to the faith. Uh, Maybe you've just given your life to Jesus and you're trying to figure out what this faith journey is really all about. Or maybe you're a Christian, you've been a Christian for a while and you have some serious doubts. You've run into some roadblocks in your faith that we provide a safe space for you over a series of weeks to hear a talk, have dinner drinks and a discussion with a great group of people. There's no preaching, there's no teaching. Really, it's all about listening and understanding. And so this is the evangelism arm of our church. Sundays at Experience are for believers. Uh, Alpha is actually church for unbelievers. And so we would love for you to be a part. Everyone at Experience, we invite you, we want you to try Alpha at least one time. Complete the Alpha course. It will help you grow in your faith. It'll help you think of the people that God has put on your heart that you could invite as well. So go ahead and pull out your phones real quick. Get them out, get them out. I want you to circle the date in your calendar. It's iCal, Google Calendar, whatever it is. Monday, January 27th, right? I believe it's 27th. I think I said it wrong last Sunday. Monday, January 27th at our space right down the street. 6.45, doors open, 7 o'clock, dinner and drinks. We listen to a talk, and then we have a very rich, meaningful discussion. This is going to be launch night. We're going to have a live jazz band that's going to be there with us, hanging out on our very first launch night. It's going to be really, really good. would love for you to come and start thinking about the people that you can invite. We'll be posting in our EXP app this week some templates of text messages that you can send to your friends to help invite them, and also some invite cards we'll have for you next week. All right, we are kicking off officially our 21 days of prayer and fasting. That's right, come on, who's excited with me? Expecting about what God's gonna do over the next three weeks together, and we're committed to becoming a praying church. This is important to us. This is something that we believe in. And so every January, as a church, we do 21 days of prayer and fasting. We usually mix up the fasting every year to keep it fresh and to create some avenues for people that are new to fasting to kind of be a part of that. And so we're committed to this. We believe in it. And then every August, what we do, so many of us travel during the summer as we kind of get back and to get in that spiritual rhythm again, we do 21 days of prayer in August. So you can write this in your message notes this morning. This is why we do prayer and fasting. Our job is to create space for God. God's job is to fill that space with more of himself. If you need message notes, just raise your hand. Our ushers will come by. And so our job is to create the space. If we create it, he is always faithful to fill it. And you know, nowhere in the Bible does it say that we need more money or we need more friends, or we even need more hope or faith, or what it says continually throughout the Bible is we need more of one thing, we need more of God. And what we're believing for over the next 21 days is you create space, God's gonna show up into that space, you're gonna get more of God. And here's what I've found, is when I get more of God, God gets more of me. He gets more of me. And so let's practically talk about what what is this space that you speak of, Mark? What is this space that you talk? How do I create this space? What is that space? Well, space is time. It's attention. It's being fully present. It's praying. It's reading the scriptures. It's listening to hear that whisper from heaven. It's hearing. It's asking. It's inquiring. It's journaling. It's meditating and thinking on God. It's releasing burdens and stress and fears, and it's receiving fresh grace. So this space we're talking about isn't really about doing, it's really about being. It's about being fully present and available and leaning in to hear and receive the promptings and the leading of the Holy Spirit. Nikki Gumbel, the pastor of HTB in London says this, that prayer is the most important activity on earth. 
the most important activity. If we believe that, I think we should give some time to it and learn about it. And we know that Jesus' disciples believed what Nikki said too because they asked Jesus to teach them one thing. They asked Jesus to teach them how to pray. And so Jesus answers their prayer by teaching them how to pray. And then right after that, we see that the disciples begin to do all the stuff that Jesus did. They begin to bring freedom to people's lives and healing and, and miracles. And they begin to share the good news. And, and they're helping all, of, all kinds of different types of people. And then they, they meet this one specific case where they pray for this person and he doesn't get better. And they're like, man, what, what's going on? And so they go back to Jesus and they're like, hey, Jesus, it, it didn't work this time. And then Jesus prays for the guy and it works, right? And then Jesus teaches him something. He says this in Matthew 17. He said, but this kind is cast out only through prayer and fasting. And so I know what you're thinking this morning. What, what, like prayer is not enough? Did the preacher really say that prayer is not enough? Jesus said it. There will be certain things in our lives that will only be broken through if we add fasting with prayer. Certain things that will not break off of us thought patterns and habits and mentalities and behaviors. Certain things that won't change unless we create that special space known as fasting, inviting the Holy Spirit in where we can have self-discipline and control, saying no to food, saying no maybe to social media or whatever it may be, whatever we're fasting from, using and strengthening that discipline of self-control in order to say yes to God. And so we believe that prayer and fasting is necessary. It's needed for you to grow and mature and ultimately become the person you were born to be. And this is why Jesus says in Matthew chapter six, he says, when you pray. I kind of wish he said, if you pray. <laughs> but he doesn't, he says, when. There's an expectation that as a follower of Jesus that you are going to grow and learn and develop into a person of prayer, a person that trusts God and talks to him and listens to him and creates dialogue and relationship with him. So he says, when you pray, there's this expectation that in our life, this is supposed to be happening. And then he, he, doesn't, he doesn't stop there. He, he continues on and he says, when you fast. Again, not an if statement, but a when statement. And so as a church, we, we try to create spaces for you to do this and for you to learn how to do this and, and for these rhythms to be nurtured and, and, and kind of uh, invested in, in your life. And so we do as a church midweek, every week here in Green Valley on Thursday nights. This past Thursday night, we had Caleb Cole from Project Church. How awesome was he, guys? We filled the space with people, and he was able to pray for a bunch of people. And it was just so encouraging to be together every Thursday night, midweek. If you've not been yet, we would encourage you to come. You are never going to be forced to pray. No one's going to put a microphone in front of your mouth and say, pray to Jesus now. That won't happen. We, we respect your, your, where you're at in your journey of prayer, but you will be invited into. You may be able to receive prayer at midweek. We would invite you to come. We also have prayer going on Mondays at noon at our space. We have prayer now. We've started Wednesday mornings at 6.30. And our hope, prayer, and desire is that eventually we'll have a noon prayer meeting Monday through Friday and before work, 6.30 a.m., Monday through Friday. We have two of them going now, believing eventually it's going to grow to 10 prayer meetings a week where you can get yourself there. You know how sometimes you don't feel like praying, but when you get yourself there, everything begins to change. Sometimes we go to a prayer meeting, not even to pray, but just to be around it, just to hear it, just to listen to it, just to receive prayer. And we do that every single Sunday in every one of our worship experiences in both locations. We give an opportunity for people to receive prayer during worship. If you've not gone back there yet, I'm telling you some of our best prayer people in the church are back there. You should go back there and receive prayer. So Jesus says, when you pray, so we're creating these spaces for us to pray. He says, when you fast, as a, as a team, last year as a staff, we fasted every Tuesday, a 24-hour fast. A couple of us on the team had some um, nutritional restraints and some health stuff, so they would cut the fast early and do a half-day fast till 3 p.m. We're committed to doing this as a staff. We've invited leadership in both locations to be a part of this. And so we've learned that a weekly rhythm of fasting can, can be really good 
along with kind of like this every January 21 days of prayer and fasting. And so we would invite you. I know John Wesley, a great revivalist, his movement, they would fast two days a week till 3 p.m., two days a week. We're doing that once a week. You're invited to join us as a staff and a team every Tuesday throughout all of 2020. We're praying and fasting together. All right, so I know you're thinking, all right, I don't, I don't know how I feel about this. This is a lot. This is maybe too much. I don't know that I can do this. Well, let, let us help you get started. Uh, there's a couple of books, and they're going to be posted in the app this week. The first book, if, if, if you're just kind of getting started in prayer, there's like this classic book you have to read. It like will give you the motivation, inspiration, and desire to pray. It's called Fresh Wind and Fresh Fire by Jim Cimbala. Just a phenomenal book. Would encourage you to get it. We'll post it in the app this week. Secondly, if you want your PhD in prayer, I mean, you wanna go like doctorate level here. You want some letters after your name in terms of prayer. There's this book by Mike Bickle, International House of Prayer in Kansas City. It's called Growing in Prayer. This book is deep, it's dense, it's powerful. You're gonna have to reread some stuff a little bit, uh, but it really helped me grow in prayer and it deepened my level of understanding of prayer. And then this is our, our favorite book. This is what Amanda says is her favorite book in prayer right now. It's called How to Pray, A Simple Guide for Normal People. Any normal person here today that wants to learn how to pray? Anybody, just, just throw up your hand. If that's you, like, hey, I wanna learn how to pray. I'm a normal person. I see you in the back. Here it comes, catch it. It landed, no one got hurt. Thank you, Jesus. Now here's what's really cool about this book. It, it's super easy to follow. Uh, it's really refreshing, really, really helpful. And I actually met the author of the book. And guess where I met the author? I met the author at a prayer meeting. <laughs> Come on, who would have thought? The guy who wrote the book on prayer, you're gonna meet him at a prayer meeting. And so here's a picture of the prayer meeting. It was actually in London on a Tuesday morning. This prayer meeting has been going on for 29 years. 7 a.m., Tuesday morning, South Kensington, London. And I'm gonna give you a video of the prayer meeting. It's piping hot. Check this video out. In the name of Jesus, amen. The British are intense and passionate when they pray. And so in this prayer meeting, they circle us up into groups of three, and, and we're praying for each other, and we have a guy in our group that's praying, and I'm like, man, this guy can really pray. You ever been around someone like that? And I'm like, wow, and I'm kind of inspired by him, and, 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 you know, and then he asked me to pray for him, and so I pray for him, and, and afterwards I tell my wife and some of the people that are at the conference with us, I, mean, I pray with this guy today, he said his name was Pete. And so, oh, what'd he look like? And I start talking to him. They're like, Mark, don't you know that is Pete Gregg? He is like the Yoda of prayer in London. He has started 24 7 prayer movements all over the world. And then you know what I immediately started thinking about? Oh my gosh, what did I even pray? <laughs> and then I was like, thank God I didn't know that he was that guy. Otherwise, I would have been like praying these like, Father, I call an intergalactic warfare from heaven to come. You know, I would have said some stupid prayer, tried to be super spiritual and tried to achieve some. So I'm kind of glad I didn't know who it was, right? But then I was also kind of frustrated I didn't get a selfie with him. But I did get a video and he's in the video right next to me. I've got proof for you. Check this out. Their prayer meetings are very similar to our midweeks. Some people next to me. Now you're gonna see Pete here, right there. That's Pete, right there. That's Pete. That's the author of the book I just threw out. He was right next to me in the prayer meeting. See, I've got living proof that he was with me. And it was an absolutely uh, incredible prayer meeting. All right, so I get it, Mark. Prayer's important, fasting is necessary. I'm just not there. I I'm just not there yet. I don't know about you, but I feel like that all the time. And so I went to our staff last week and I said, guys, tell me, give me one word to describe your prayer life. Here's, here's what our team said. They said, <clears throat> it's scattered, changing, kind of wild. Sometimes there's answers. It's safe and it's slow burning. And then I asked them, give me one word to describe what you want your prayer life to be like. And here's what they said, structured, faithful, more and longer, hunger and powerful. Here's what I've learned. We actually have to be led into prayer. We don't really lead ourselves into prayer. Jesus led his disciples into prayer by modeling prayer and continually and constantly inviting them to prayer. 
And so we as followers of Jesus, we have to be led into prayer and we are doing our very best as a leadership team at Experience to lead you into prayer because that's where things happen. That's where things change. That's where you grow. We have to be led into prayer. And so if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Genesis chapter eight. That's where we're gonna get started this morning. And uh, this scripture actually comes from me creating space for God to speak to me. And as he spoke to me on this three-day prayer retreat, which we're gonna show you some pictures about in a little bit, is he spoke to me in such a profound way, and it was found here in Genesis chapter eight. This is what the Bible says. Noah and God. He waited another seven days after the flood had come and it had ceased, and again he sent forth the dove out of the ark, and the dove came back to him in the evening, and behold, in her mouth was a freshly plucked olive leaf. So Noah knew that the waters had subsided from the earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow, my rainbow, in the cloud, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When the bow, the rainbow, is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. Let's just close our eyes and pray real quick. Father, we ask today that you would illuminate your word. Use it to shape us and fill us. Give us a fresh hunger to know you today. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. amen. Back in November, uh, I embarked on my third annual prayer and silence retreat which is a, a three-day retreat that I do in the fall as I prepare my heart for vision for the future. And so there's kind of this excitement and this expectancy as you pray and you kind of get to the location. I've been to a monastery. I've been at a cabin out in the woods. This particular time back in November, I was up past Reading uh, at the, the foot of uh, Lake Shasta. And I had rented this little a cottage on Airbnb and I walk into this little cottage and I come in and it looks almost the exact same as the basement of my grandfather and grandma's house. That my grandfather was a carpenter, he built with his own hands. It even kind of smelled like it. And I had so many great memories with my cousins in, in that basement. I walk in and I'm like, wow, this is weird. This is like nostalgic. And as I'm in that little cottage, I see, I look to the right and there's this shaft of green light coming to the middle of the room. And I'm like, man, what is that? And so I go around to look, and this is what I see right as I kind of move around the room. I see this stained glass image of this. And I, I'm pretty sure there's no other Airbnbs at Lake Shasta with that. And I'm pretty sure there's probably no other Airbnbs in the whole state of California with that. And, and what's even more funny is I was at this kind of, I had this kick going on that staff was giving me a hard time about is that uh, I'm like, man, guys, we need stained glass in the church. Let's get some easels and some stained glass and make it feel historic and beautiful and ancient and we can connect with God at a deeper level. And they're like, Mark, you're crazy. Like, just get stained glass in your room or something. Like, we don't need it at church and we got to set it up. And, and they made good points. But I was on this stained glass thing and literally a lot of times when you do these prayer silence retreats and you... See, God, a lot of times God speaks at the very end. And here I am, I haven't been in the cottage for more than two minutes. I've got this stained glass thing going on in my life and boom, the picture comes. And it's like God could not have spoken more clearly to me than that image in stained glass. And so let's, let's unpack a little bit what, what this actually means. The dove is representative of the Holy Spirit. We see in the New Testament that when Jesus is baptized, the Holy Spirit comes like a dove. We see the olive branch in the dove's mouth indicates the, the anointing that they crushed olives in the Old Testament and created the anointing oil. And the anointing oil in the Old Testament signifies and symbolizes the power and presence of God. The rainbow indicates the promises of God being fulfilled. And then we see each color in the rainbow has meaning and significance. The blue signifies the washing and the cleansing of regeneration of the Holy Spirit. The purple signifies our identity as royalty, sons and daughters of our King. The green signifies life and growth and health and vitality. The gold signifies the glory of God. Orange signifies the fire of Pentecost and the coming of the Holy Spirit and red 
bread signifies the blood of Jesus and forgiveness from our sins. Now here's what's so beautiful about this image, is that God gives the rainbow to Noah knowing that Jesus would be the fulfillment of everything that that rainbow means. He was forward thinking to redemption, looking past the cross to the empty tomb, to eventually the ascension and the birth of his church at Pentecost. And so we see that God indicates through this rainbow the promises of God being received and becoming reality in our lives. And so what we're believing for throughout 2020 is that the pages of this book that are filled with over 5,000 promises, that these promises will go out of the pages and into your heart. And those promises living in your heart will eventually come to pass in your life. They will become reality in your life. There's so many promises in the Bible. There's promises about your past, your present, and your future. There's promises about health and wealth relationships and reconciliation, promises about family and feelings and even fear, promises about hope and healing and help. This book is full of treasures that can become truths in your life if you receive them by faith. So how does this actually happen? Hebrews 6 says this, so that you may not be sluggish. I don't think any of us want to live in a perpetual Monday morning. We don't wanna live in this state of sluggishness. No, that's why we have a little giddy up in our stride right now, because it's a new year, it's a new decade, it's a fresh start. God doesn't want us living sluggish. So he says, so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherited the promises. See, faith and patience ultimately make the promises of God reality in our lives. We can't have one without the other. We want the promises, we can't just have faith. And we can't just have patience, we gotta have both. See, if we have faith without patience, we're just gonna burn out. We're gonna get excited and then it's gonna fade and fizzle. If we, if we just have patience with no faith, then what's gonna happen is we're gonna be sluggish and we're gonna be waiting without believing. So we actually have to have both. It's, it's like if you put a steak on a grill. You can have that, that, that grill piping hot and you can burn the outside and the, and the middle's bloody red. Who wants to eat that? You don't want that. Nobody wants it burnt on the outside and, and mooing on the inside. That doesn't taste good, right? Or you could also put that steak on the grill and you're sitting there waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and, wait, and nothing changes because the fire's not on. That's not gonna do anybody any good either. No, we gotta have faith and patience. We gotta let that thing marinate and cook and burn and we gotta let it become what it's supposed to be. And that only happens through faith and patience. So we've got a little illustration for you this morning from the scriptures. This is Luke chapter 11. You'll see our door up here today as well. Here we go, Luke 11. It says, then Jesus gave this illustration. Imagine what would happen if you were to go to one of your friends in the middle of the night and pound on his door. And shout. Where's the mic? <laughs> but your friend says, Why are you bothering me? The door is locked, and my family and I are in bed. Do you expect me to get up and give you our food? But listen, because of your shameless impudence, even though it's the middle of the night, your friend will get up out of his bed and give you all that you need. Come on, let's give him a hand. So it is with your prayers. Ask and you'll receive. Seek and you'll discover. Knock on heaven's door and it will one day open for you. Every persistent person will get what he asks for. Every persistent seeker will discover what he needs. And everyone who knocks persistently will one day find an open door. Let me explain something from this teaching of Jesus. It says that he asked for three loaves. But then, as Jesus teaches this, the person that comes to the door says, I'll give you whatever you need. I want you to see this knocking on door as a metaphor for prayer. 
that when we pray, we will always get more than we need. We'll always have more than we need. I love that the person knocking on the door isn't knocking for themselves. They're really knocking for their friend. God can answer our prayers for other people. And then what I love is I love the timing of the knock. Can I tell you in prayer, there's never a bad time to knock. You can knock at midnight or midday or mid-morning or mid-afternoon, before breakfast, after breakfast, in between. You can knock at any time of any day. He will always answer. He will always answer us. And so I want to teach you this morning how to knock. How do we knock? Number one, write it down. Keep it simple. Prayer should not require a thesaurus with a big vocabulary. No, prayer should be really simple. We should get to the point. Don't beat around the bush. Don't candy coat. Say what you mean. Mean what you say. Keep it simple. Can I tell you, he knows what you need even before you ask. The problem is most of the time when we start knocking, we don't really know what we need. But if we keep knocking, eventually we will know what we need because many times he shows us what we need in the knocking. So we keep it simple. Number two, keep it real. Can I tell you something? God can handle your emotion. He can handle your complaining. He can handle your frustration, your anger. He can handle your your energy, most of the time, lack thereof, right? He can handle all that. So we gotta keep it real. It's gotta be honest. You gotta say what you're really thinking and really feeling. Can I tell you, for the longest time, I had a hard time with this because I'm like, I don't wanna offend God. Then he won't give me what I'm asking for. And then I read the book of Psalms. And there's this guy named David. And in many ways, he's like, just laying it all out. He says some stuff. I'm like, I can't believe he said that. But see, it was real. David was feeling it and he was thinking it. So he shared it with God. Our prayer has to be real. We got to keep it simple. We got to keep it real. And lastly, we got to keep it going. Don't stop. It's just like a fire. You got to tend to it. You got to put another log on it. You got to move it around. You got to clean up the ash. You got to keep that thing going. And guess what? If it goes out, that's okay. Get it started again. Get it going again. There have been midweeks that I have come to where I feel like prayer in my life is just about gone out. And then I get around other people that are praying and immediately that flame starts again. There are going to be Sundays when you come to church and you don't feel like coming, you don't want to come, you're kind of complaining the whole ride is too far away and the parking and the coffee isn't even hot right now and da da da. You just got to get yourself here. You just got to keep showing up because when you make space for God, he fills it with more of himself. And what you want and need more than anything is more of God. Your life will get better if you get more of God. Your whole life will get better. Pete Gregg says it like this, you cannot grow in prayer without some measure of effort and discomfort, self-discipline and self-denial. So there was this study uh, done with American first graders and Japanese first graders, standardized math tests, and researchers discovered that these Japanese children always scored better than American kids. And so they gave them this this problem, and they weren't looking for these kids to solve this puzzle. They were seeing how long long they would stick with it before they actually quit. And what they found in this study is that the American kids would quit after 9.47 minutes. The Japanese kids wouldn't quit until they got to 13.93 minutes, almost 14 minutes. So literally, the Japanese children were 40% more persistent than the American kids. And the researchers realized it's not that these other kids are smarter, it's just that they're more persistent. They're just willing to stick with it longer. And many of those kids didn't even solve the puzzle, but they just stuck with it longer. See, with each answered prayer, we draw bigger prayer circles. With each act of faithfulness, our faith increases. And with each promise kept, our persistence quotient grows. I love that persistency quotient. What's your persistency quotient? How many times do you knock before you stop? You knock once and then deuces, I'm out. You knock twice. Maybe, maybe, you, knock, maybe you knock for a day. 
I'm just, I'm just gonna keep knocking until that thing happens. Or maybe, maybe you don't knock for a day. Maybe you're willing to go two days or even a week. And you know, there are different types of knocks. There's like, that's the police. You don't answer that door. That's the, you know that, all right? Then there's other knocks where it's like closed fisted. You're just pounding. God, do something in my family. God, do something in my career. God, do something in my marriage. God, my kids, they, they're away, they're far. God, you pound. And then, and then there's sometimes you got no strength or energy to knock. You just kind of headbutt. God, do something, Lord, right? Anybody, anybody ever been there, right? What's your persistency quotient? Are you willing to knock for a month? Are you willing to knock for a year? Are you prepared to knock for decades until that thing opens? Because I can tell you, what's on the other side of this door is worth every single knock. It's worth every single prayer, every single ask. It's always worth it. So what's your quotient? How persistent are you willing to be? One of my faith heroes, D.L. Moody, revivalist, Chicago, he had a prayer list with 100 names on it of people that were close to him but far from God. He personally led 93 of those 100 people to Christ. And he had, he had all of their names in a paper that he would put in his jacket pocket and he would walk around with those names every single day and he'd pray by name over every one of those people. In his last days, he still was praying for the seven that had yet to give their life to Christ. Didn't know where they were, didn't know how to contact them, no email back then, no Facebook. And so he ends up dying and at his funeral, those seven people come to the funeral and they respond to the gospel message. All hundred people came to Christ. I want you to write this down this morning. Prayer grows your persistency and persistency grows your prayers. If you just start praying, you're gonna get more persistent. Your persistency quotient is going to go up. And here's what happens. As your persistency grows, you're gonna grow bigger prayers, bolder prayers. Prayers not just for you, but for others. Things are gonna begin to happen. And can I tell you today that God is still good even if the door doesn't open. See, the, the number one reason why we don't keep knocking is because we don't think the door's ever gonna open, but can I tell you that God is still good even if the door never opens. Think about Mr. Moody. He didn't question whether or not God was good. God opened the door after he was gone. That's how powerful God is. He's opening doors that you haven't even thought of existed. Right? And so we've got to be people that know how to knock. We know how to pray. And I refuse to have a door that's closed that won't open because I won't knock. How many doors do I have in my life that God's just sitting there waiting for me to knock in order to open? But he will not force doors open that I'm not willing to knock on. And can I tell you, sometimes a shut door can be a good door. I've found in my life that some of those shut doors were actually me dodging bullets. God actually rescuing me from my own stupidity. It was him actually being kind. No, nah, you really don't want what's behind that door. So we've got to learn to trust him. We've got to embrace the mystery of it all. And so let's get real practical here before we pray this morning. We've got to make prayer enjoyable and easy if it's ever going to be consistent. We've got to make it enjoyable, and we've got to make it easy. Mark Batterson says this. Do you have a favorite place to pray, a place where you get better reception, a place where your mind is more focused, a place where you have more faith? I don't know about you, but I have a place like that. I have a, a chair that was given to me by my, my grandfather, who he prayed many prayers in that chair. That's the, the chair. He called it his prayer chair, and he made it with his own hands, and so I have like this legacy that I get to sit in. And for some reason, when I'm in that chair, I think about all the prayers that he prayed that God answered. And it's just like, I'm ready to pray now. So I'm in my chair and grandpa paved the way and I'm standing on his shoulders. And so there's just this confidence that comes to me in my prayer chair. 
Here's what we need to do in order to make this easy and enjoyable, which then renders it much more consistent, is we gotta find our best time. Find your best time. Me, that's in the morning. I hear the most clearly in the morning. I'm most inspired in the morning. I'm least distracted early in the morning. Before the kids are up, before the sun comes up, that's when I'm at my best. Now, I know I am a freak of nature and nobody else here is like that. That's just me. I'm not trying to make you like me. You don't need to be a morning person. I know we're super annoying in the morning for all the non-morning people. I get it. I try to tone it down a bit. You gotta find your best time. Maybe it's lunch, maybe it's afternoon, maybe it's mid, I don't know what your best time is, but you've gotta find your best time. You gotta give that to the Lord. Second, you gotta commit to your best place. Where do you pray the best? Is it in the car? Is it in the shower? Is it with with a, for me it'd be a mug, a bowl of coffee. Not a little sipper, like I'm talking like, yes, fully immersed with coffee. Any place with coffee, I just pray better. My dog Champ and I, we we go on this little walk to the top of the hill in the city every morning at sunrise. We walk there together and I I look out over the Bay Bridge and I look out over the Salesforce Tower and I look out over the Bay and I just pray for revival every morning. Renewal and awakening. My heart is so stirred as I see people scurrying about and in their cars and everybody going everywhere with their busy lives, crying out for God to move on behalf of our city. You gotta find your best time, commit to your best place, and then you just gotta keep showing up. Make it an appointment in your calendar with notifications, and you keep that appointment with God. You just keep showing up. Because we've gotta be people that know how to knock, who are committed to knocking. We don't stop knocking. We just keep knocking. We don't forget to knock. We don't get distracted from knocking day in, day out, spring, summer, fall, winter. I'm just gonna keep on knocking. Mark, what are you gonna do in 2020? I'm gonna keep doing what I've been doing. I'm just gonna keep on knocking. I'm gonna keep on knocking. I'm knocking for my city. I'm knocking for my church. I'm knocking for my family. I'm knocking for my marriage. I'm knocking for my kids. I'm knocking for revival. I'm knocking for renewal. I'm knocking for awakening. I'm knocking for breakthrough. I'm knocking for God to show up on my behalf. I'm just gonna keep on, I don't know. I don't know how to quit. I've been doing it so long, that's all I know. It feels weird when I'm not knocking now. Because this is just who I am. I've become this person that just won't stop knocking. And that's the person that God wants you to become. And I'm going to be honest with you. I wish it was just that quick and it happened. It doesn't. It takes years. It takes a lot of stopping and starting. It takes a, a lot of ups, downs, and lefts, and rights, and peaks, and valleys. But if you just stay the course, God will show up on your behalf. And I just felt this week... As I was in prayer, that I, I want to invite slash challenge every person, go all in. Go all in. Not just for this month of January, not just for this year of 2020. What if you were to give the Lord the next 10 years of your life, the next decade? One of our, our church friends, North Point Church, they did this big study, and they found that Sundays and sermons don't lead to any type of transformation that the only thing that led to significant change in the lives of their people are when they got involved in community in three, at least three ways. So they started serving, they got involved. They didn't just show up to church on Sundays, they actually started serving. They made this place home and family. They started giving and contributing and investing into the vision and the future of their community. And then they got into community groups or prayer groups or alpha, they found community outside of Sunday. That just showing up is okay when you're getting started, but that's not where we can stay. We, we, we grow, we take steps, and sometimes it's just baby steps. I know there are some people here today, it took everything for you just to be here today. You were probably fighting the devil in the parking lot, sitting in your car, should I go in, should I go home? Should I stay or should I go? And then you thought of a million reasons why you should leave, and then the Holy Spirit spoke and you walked in. And now you're here today. I know that battle, I've had that battle in my own life. It's very real. And guess what? God will honor baby steps. And then eventually those steps become strides. And those strides become momentum. And you look back and you're like, how on earth did I get here? (laughs) Only by the hand of God. So here's what I want to do. I I want you to get out these cards. Have we handed these out yet? Yeah, we have them out. Get them out. Get them out. 
Our team's been working on this. We're gonna pray over these here in a moment. And what we have for you over the next 21 days, we're gonna be going after this all of 2020, is we're gonna teach you promises from the scripture and how to receive them. And so what we have is we have on the back of this a 21 day devotional and we have a scripture every day that you can declare and proclaim over your life. Next Sunday, we're gonna have the next seven days and the Sunday after that, we'll have the next seven days after that. We'll have a new card for you the next two Sundays. And then we have leaders in both locations that have written a devotional that we're gonna post in the app with a question. We want you guys all to comment and be a part of that discussion, get some community going online. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna lead you. If you'll follow, if you'll take some baby steps with us, if you'll come alongside us, we're gonna lead you into a deeply rich and meaningful time of prayer. And I'm believing that we're gonna have these cards this year. We're gonna look back and we're gonna be able to put some stars next to some of these promises that we see God fulfilling in our lives. And so we'll have the daily devotion. We'll be on our EXP app. If you haven't downloaded that yet, you can go to Google Play, you can go to uh, iTunes, and it's really simple, the app store, it's EXP Home. You can download that app, you'll see it every morning. It's actually already been posted for today. And then this week, we're kicking off fasting, and we're starting the fast, starts today, with actually one meal a day that we're not gonna eat. And during that one meal a day, we're actually going to pray. That's the key, it's just not eating, it's forgoing food in order to get spiritual food in order to pray, in order to connect with God. And so this week, and I'm not gonna give you next week or the following week, but it will be different, and it won't all be food. So just, I'll just leave it there. And so this week, we're inviting the Holy Spirit to come, and it could be breakfast, lunch, dinner, whatever it may be. You give that meal and you take some time to pray, to open up the scriptures and perhaps read the Bible in a year like so many of you are. You guys are off to such a great start. I've been so encouraged by the comments in the Bible in a year. So let's just stand on our feet. Let's just hold this car. I want to invite the Holy Spirit.